I am the greatest. All right, very special episode today. Um, February 25th will be the 60th anniversary of Muhammad Ali, Sonny Liston, Miami Beach, uh, the heavyweight championship. Uh, people say it was a pivotal you know, moment in sports, changed a lot of things. And here today to help me take us back in time, get in the DeLorean, the, the back to the future, and go back to that very special day is a, uh, I, I really should be doing this uh, with my Michael Buffer or Howard Cosell voice, but uh, <laughs> boxing historian, former boxing promoter, businessman, former, bo a lot of people don't know this, former amateur fighter, but most important, my friend, fan of the show, Ramiro Ortiz. How you doing, buddy? Great, Danny. It's great to see you. Great to be with you. Uh, uh, this will be a lot of fun. Like I said, so take us back in time. First of all, where were you on February 25th uh, 1964. <laughs> Where was I? I was one of about 10 or 12 guys. Interestingly enough, your dad knows some of the guys that were with me. Uh, and we could not even dream of getting a ticket. I mean, of are course. you kidding me? Um, but in those days, championship fights were on the radio. Mm -hmm. So we were at the Miami Beach Convention Center outside yeah. just to get the atmosphere because I was a boxing nut at that time. I was 14, but a boxing nut. And we all had our transistor radios and listening to the fight. So tell me about the state of, you know, pe people now remember the fight probably a little different, but take me back to the state of the heavyweight division in 1964. What was going on? Well, let me spend a minute first of course, on the heavyweight division itself. Sure. Okay. Because there was a magical aura about being the heavyweight champion of the world. If you were the heavyweight champion of the world back in the day, you were the baddest ass on the planet. Yes. Yeah. It was the most coveted title in sports. In the late 1800s, John L. Sullivan, the Boston strong boy. In the teens, you had Jack Johnson, the Galveston Giants, six yep. foot two. In the roaring 20s, the Manasseh Mahler, Jack Dempsey, in the 30s, Joe Lewis, the Brown Bomber. And then in the 50s, Rocky Marciano, the Brockton Blockbuster, undefeated. And here's where the story starts turning into what happens with Cassius Clay. 1955 in Yankee Stadium, and that's the heavyweight championship of yep. the world. I mean, you're defending it in Yankee Stadium, a sold-out Yankee Stadium. He's defending the title against Archie Moore, who was a light heavyweight champion. He knocks out Archie Moore. And all of a sudden, unexpectedly, he retires. Well, Archie Moore was a light heavyweight champion. Mm -hmm. They have a tournament. One, the A side of the tournament is won by Archie Moore, the guy that Marciano had just knocked out. That's not very inspiring. Correct. The B side, young kid from New York, Floyd Patterson. He was from New York. Everybody yeah. loved him. Olympic gold medal winner. As Patterson grows into a light heavyweight, he's beaten everybody. Patterson was a very talented fighter, very fast hands, great left hook. And Kosti Amato matches him up with Ingemar Johansson. And he knocks out Patterson, knocks him down seven times, also in Yankee Stadium. They have a rematch. This fight, first fight was 1959. They have a rematch in 1960. And Patterson knocks out Ingemar Johansson. <laughs> Now, Johansson is claiming for a rematch. While Patterson and Johansson are playing ping pong with the title. And you got these top 10 contenders and a fringe contender named Sonny Liston. Mm -hmm. who can't get a break. Liston, uh, who had had a very tough childhood, ran away from home and in and out of jail his entire life. Yeah. Nobody will give him a break. And the mob takes over because right. they see they see this monster. And the mob had a lot of influence in boxing. And a guy named Frankie Carbo makes a deal because he ran the boxing division of the mob. And he makes a deal with several boxing promoters and says, hey, I'll get you the TV dates for the Friday night fights. But you got to put Sonny Liston on the show. And then they, and this this will end up being a very important part of the story, because their logic is 
let's just work our way number 10, number nine, number eight, seven, blah, 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 and work our right. way through the top 10, and they'll have no choice. Well, it's exactly what they do. And they start. Wayne Bethia, Lister knocks him out. Nino Valdez, he knocks him out. Mike DeJohn knocks him out. Zora Foley knocks him out. Cleveland Williams, who was considered the hardest puncher in the division, he knocks him out in the third round. Cleveland Williams makes the mistake of saying, hey, yeah, it was a lucky, it was a lucky punch. They fight again. Liston knocks him out in the second round this time. He fights Albert Westphal, the German heavyweight champion. Knocks him out in the first round. And then this is where boxing, boxing history is so fascinating because yeah, of course. Things, things happen that, you know, how can you explain? Kosti Amaru is ducking Sonny Liston. I mean, he don't want to be even in he doesn't want to be in his neighborhood, let alone... He knows. He, he doesn't want him in the, in the same zip code as Sonny yeah. Liston. But everywhere Patterson, who is a very proudful man, goes, it's, when are you fighting Liston? When are you fighting Liston? So President Kennedy was a huge sports fan, particularly boxing, and he wants to meet Floyd Patterson, the heavyweight champion of the world. And Liston had just come off knocking out Albert Westphal in the first round. And in the conversation, JFK says, when are you going to fight Sonny Liston? Now, this is, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. Mm -hmm. Patterson takes it as, I got an order from the president of the United States <laughs> to fight Sonny Liston. Custy Amato said, I don't give a shit who that guy is. I'm your manager. You ain't fighting that guy because of his connection. He couldn't tell him because he'll beat him because right. of his connections to the mob. And we don't want to give a guy that's connected to the mob a chance. And Patterson says, no, I'm fighting him. The president of the United States says I have to fight him. And they make the fight. Well, Sonny Liston knocks out Patterson in the first round in Chicago. Blows him away. They have a rematch. He knocks him out in the first round again. So now you've got this literal, literally monster yeah. And and just to put into perspective, Danny, if you can imagine the aura around Mike Tyson when he was a heavyweight champion of the world in the early years, multiply it by 10. That was the aura of Sonny Liston. All the articles in all the boxing magazines weren't uh, based on who could beat him, who would make a good fight. It was, is this the greatest heavyweight who ever lived? Right. Those were the articles an imposing figure. While all of this is going on, you got this kid growing up in Louisville and uh, strange fate. He's winning a bunch of amateur tournaments and so forth. And in 1958, I think it was, Angelo Dundee, Louisville was an important boxing spot. Mm -hmm. Angelo Dundee's in Louisville with Willie Pastrano, who went on to become light heavyweight champion of the world. Very fleet-footed, good boxer. Cassius Clay learns that they're in town. To hear Angelo tell the story, him and Willie are in a hotel room, killing time watching TV. Phone rings. Willie Pastrano answers the phone and says, hey, there's some nutty kid. His name is Cassius Clay. Says he's won the Louisville Golden Gloves. He's going to win the Midwestern Golden Gloves. He's going to win the national championship. He's going to go to the Olympics, going to win the Olympics, and then he's going to become the heavyweight champion of the world. He says he wants to come up and meet us. And Angelo says, what the hell, Willie? There's nothing to do. There's nothing good on TV. Let this nutty kid up. And Angelo was taken by not the fact that he wouldn't stop talking, yeah. but the, the questions that he was asking and, and the depth of the questions and the curiosity. So, Willie, how far do you run? Do you run like a mile for per each round? Do you start running? When in your training do you start running? How many rounds do you spar? How many rounds do you think an amateur should spar? And after two hours, they finally tell the kid, hey, look, Willie needs some rest. You got to get out of here. <laughs> uh, but they, they were, Angelo particularly was taken by the fact that for two hours, all he did was ask questions. So he's signed by a group of uh, Louisville businessmen. Um, 
and it turned out to be a great investment for these guys, but really they were just a bunch of businessmen who wanted to help a local yeah. kid make it. They first sent him off to San Diego for Archie Moore to train him. That lasts like less than a week. Archie's got him in his training camp, sweeping the floors and washing dishes. <laughs> and Cassius Clay says, hey, I'm here to win the heavyweight championship of the world, not to sweep yeah. floors. And then Cassius remembers that 1958 meeting with Angelo Dundee. And Angelo Dundee was already a big name. And he tells the syndicate he wants to be trained by Angelo Dundee. They reach out to Angelo Dundee, and it was, if there was ever a perfect setup, it was that. Because you had the combination of Angelo Dundee, manager and trainer. Yeah. You had the Fifth Street Gym. That was the Harvard University of Boxing, because mm -hmm. every great fighter in the country trained there. And then you had Chris Dundee, who was one of the more important promoters in the country throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Every Tuesday night, Chris had fights. Wow. And then, and then, this was before he moved into Overtown, they had all these little dilapidated hotels, which would become uh, first Art Deco and then South Beach. But at this time, they were just little dilapidated, crappy little hotels where Angelo could keep the fighters. And this was wow. like, this was like November of, or October of 1960. And Angelo says, well, listen, give yourself a nice little break and show up in January. And he says, no, 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 no. I want to fight right now. And, you know, they bring him down to Miami Beach and, and the rest is history. Now, interestingly enough, in those early 1960 days at the Fifth Street Gym, Cassius Clay was a borderline lunatic, <laughs> literally, that nobody paid a lot of attention to. You had... Guys there like Willie Pastrano, Louis Rodriguez, Florentino Fernandez, Ralph Dupas, Sugar Ray Robinson would come and train. Floyd Patterson would train. Ingemar Johansson would come and train. And Cassius Clay, yeah, he's an Olympic gold medal. And he'd go around. They wouldn't take him seriously. I'm the greatest. Patterson, Johansson, you know why those bums are fighting? Because they don't want to fight me. Uh, and and. And he starts the whole this, yeah. thing. But what's interesting is this. As Liston and Patterson are fighting and so forth, and Cassius Clay starts his career in Miami Beach because of the setup with Chris Dundee. And he's fighting at the Miami Beach Auditorium and starts making a name for himself. But as Cassius Clay progresses, the deeper he gets into the water, He's not looking all that good. Right. But every time. Because he got a couple times, right, in his first few fights, didn't he? Yeah. Sonny Banks knocks him down. Um, he's not looking impressive. But every time he fights, the place is sold out. Exactly. That's important. <laughs> he had taken his gig when he was in California with Archie Moore. Archie took him to a wrestling match. And there was a wrestler named Gorgeous George. Mm -hmm. would go around telling everybody how pretty he was, blah, blah, blah. And he notices everybody's booing him, but there's a lot of asses in those seats. Yep. And he takes the, he takes the gig from, from Gorgeous George. And all the time in the gym, he won't stop talking. And the fighters themselves think this kid's nutty. And to give you an idea of his promotional ability, he fights Doug Jones. In New York, by now he's starting to get up there, and there's a newspaper strike. Madison Square Garden wants to postpone the fight. He says, "Hell no, don't do that." He says, "I, I don't need no newspaper man," and he makes a bet with the promoter. He says, "I'm going to walk down two blocks of Manhattan. By the end of the second block, if I don't have 200 people following me, then you cancel the fight." And he just starts walking from the hotel. Come to meet Cassius Clay. I'm the greatest man in the world. I'm going to beat that ugly bear. And it goes on and on and on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's a mob. Not 200. There's probably 800 people yeah. around him. And, but he doesn't look particularly good. Mm -hmm. Then he fights Henry Cooper. Cooper puts him down in the, in the fourth round with a left hook. And he always had a story. Cooper knocks him down. 
I mean, knock it would if it would have been in the middle of the round, he would have been knocked out. Mm. Cooper knocks him down in the fourth round. He gets up, wobbly walks his way back to the corner. Angelo revives him. And of course, the question is, what happened? Well, at that time, Cleopatra was the most famous movie going on. Elizabeth Taylor, who was a drop dead gorgeous movie star, was Cleopatra. She was sitting at ringside with Richard Burton. What does <laughs> what does Cassius say? I wanted to get a good look at Cleopatra. That's why I went down. <laughs> just a character. Just a character. But in Miami Beach, the Fifth Street Gym, now it's every time he shows up to train, the place is packed. Right. Because he's so entertaining. And he walks. I mean, nobody had ever seen anything like this before. Yeah. He'd walk into the gym. Where's that big, ugly bear? He doesn't even want to train here. He's afraid of me. I'm going to fight him right now. And Chris Dundee, who was the co-promoter of the fight, to avoid a problem because they had already yeah. seen the fight, he had list and training at the Surfside Community Center. He didn't want these guys together. Yeah. And Cassius Clay, would he dogged. Sonny Liston. He would follow Sonny Liston everywhere he went. He had chains and a bear trap with him. Where's, <laughs> where's that big, ugly bear? And he literally got under Sonny's skin. And this yeah. was in the whole buildup, even before yeah. training. Sonny, who wanted to be considered a good heavyweight champion, had just bought a home in Denver, of all places. In a nice suburban neighborhood. What does Cassius Clay do? He rents a bus. And at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, shows up in the neighborhood. Honking the horn. Imagine the middle of suburbia. Yeah, in Denver in 1960. <laughs> Where's that big ugly bear? What does that mean? He's afraid to fight me and so forth. By the time that they're training, Liston wants to kill him. Right. But Sonny thinks it's an easy fight. I mean, if Henry Cooper knocked him down, the hell is going to kill him? They, they, you know, Liston was a man of very few words. And in interviews, they would ask him things like, uh, what do you think of Clay mouthing off? After one round, he won't be mouthing off anymore. Those were the sorts of answers that yeah. he would give. And Cassius Clay, I mean, he wrote poems about the fight. He was and brilliant. He was brilliant. brilliant. Stand in the middle of the ring, and I don't, you know, I don't remember. That, but you know, yeah. those of you who won't be able to see the fight, you're going to see the witnessing of a human satellite. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. On and on with these, and, and but it was the fight was more of a curiosity mm -hmm. than uh, all the betting was. Is the fight going to go one round, two rounds, or three rounds? Amazing. But, but Clay was training like a fiend at the Fifth Street Gym. He had a house in Overtown. Mm -hmm. He would run across the MacArthur Causeway. And if you notice pictures of Clay running, at any time during his career, by the way, after he became Muhammad Ali and everything else, he would always run in construction boots. Yeah. Not tennis shoes or anything. He'd run to the gym. He'd train. And one more round, one more round. And Angelo literally had to throw him out of the gym. Angelo, Angelo used to call him Cash. Cash, that's it. Get the hell out of here. No, man, that ugly bear. I'm going to do one more round. Just do it. In the meantime, a bunch of us would also go to Surfside to uh -huh. watch and train. And, you know, my very first impression, because we were gym rats. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Saturdays, we'd go to the gym. And, you know, you we saw Cassius Clay up close and personal. He was a, even then he was an imposing figure. Yeah. Oh, well, we saw Sonny, who was the monster. And guess what? You know, is it my imagination? But Cassius is actually a little bit taller than him. Mm -hmm. And Liston was going through the motions training. He jumped rope to a, a jazz song called Night Train. Then yeah. he'd bar a couple of rounds with a light heavyweight named Fanita Fox, just beat the bejesus out of this poor guy. Hit the heavy bag. His trainer was a big man named Willie Reddish. He'd throw a medicine ball at him. What the hell good that did, I don't know. But the crowd at Surfside, 
oh, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And Liston's comments were, the hell am I training so hard for? This kid's not going to last more than a couple. And, and Linston at that point, like he, he was one of those guys that he never knew his own age, right? Like, like they thought he was 34, but he might've been 38. One of those kind of things. Uh, it's, it's, um, uh, Liston is such an interesting, uh, Liston is probably the only world known athletes, athlete that nobody ever knew the day he was born because there was no birth record. Yeah. It's crazy. And nobody ever knew the day he died. Because his wife, Geraldine, found him dead after four or five days. In a hotel in Vegas, right? Right. And, and, and there's always the mob. I mean, we could do a whole podcast you on Sonny Liston. Because he, he's, he's a fascinating. There's a, uh, the Devil and Sonny Liston is the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a great book. Great and book. Uh, he's a fascinating character that, that a lot of people, you know, obviously Ali overshadowed him definitely at this period. But he, and, and a sad figure, right? That yeah. the mob really took advantage of this guy. Sorry, but... You know, his answer was, how old are you, Sonny? Uh -huh. Always say, I'm 31. And people would question him. and <laughs> they had no idea. <laughs> and then, I mean, he was a bear, right? Yeah. And then his answer was, that's what my mama said. So you calling my mama a liar? Oh, shit. That's that guy. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Nobody, no. <laughs> so, people would say he was 31 going on 42. That's what crazy. That's what so, what. so, so the buildup of the fight. Walk me through the way in, the week of, and then this random story, which I don't know. I'm asking you for the first time. Why were the Beatles there? Like I, I don't, I never got that. So, so walk me through that that buildup of the week. Well, my, <laughs> oh man, these are just great times and great memories because you know you're 14 years old. You're, you're yeah, you're in the middle of all of this. We're skipping school to go to these press conferences yeah. and. Uh, Miami Beach was on a one week vacation Yeah, the week of the fight everything was the fight and all the rumors were crazy now something that very few people know Ed Sullivan started his career as a boxing writer for one of the New York papers I had no idea loved boxing so the Beatles make their debut in New York but they had signed for two Ed Sullivan shows. Well, the fight is February 25th. Ed Sullivan brings his show, his second show, to Miami Beach. I think it was at the watch the fight. <laughs> hotel that wanted to watch the fight. Now, here's the funny part. A guy named Harold Conrad, who was a great publicist. He was a legendary publicist. Yeah. Boxing. Well, Harold Conrad works up a deal to get the Beatles to come to the Fifth Street Gym. John Lennon doesn't want to go. He says, that guy's going to lose a fight. Let's go <laughs> see Sonny Liston. Really? Harold Conrad knows that Sonny Liston is a mean guy and now yeah. fight. He's a real mean guy and he ain't going to be entertained by a bunch yeah. of guys that, you know. And Conrad says, no, nah, I don't think so. And he also knows it's going to be poor, the poor publicity thing. It's going yeah, to yeah, yeah. He says, let's go to the Fifth Street Gym and see Cassius Clay. Cassius Clay has just finished working out. He's coming out of his locker room. Harold Conrad goes running. He says, oh, and by the way, and you got to hear Susie Dundee, Chris Dundee's uh, daughter, tell the story. Chris calls Susie. He says, honey, these guys, the Beatles, Harold wants to have them come over to the gym. Do you think it's a good idea? <laughs> yeah, Dad, it's a real good idea. Get and them. I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, get them there. The Beatles show up. Cassius Clay starts his thing. You've seen the pictures a hundred times. Yeah. Where they in the middle of the ring, he hits one, and like a domino effect, they all go down. Another picture where they've knocked him down. He goes through the whole routine with the Beatles. The place is mobbed. It's crazy. And then he turns to Ferdy Pacheco. He says, "Who the hell are those guys?" He had no idea. He had no idea. <laughs> His whole life was boxing, but he knew they were somebody, and he had to put on a show. So yeah, that's funny. He put that on that whole show. And I had no idea who the hell the Beatles were. <laughs> so, but that was that was part that of that was the week. That was the event. And 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 take me to sort of the the mood where it literally everyone thought Sonny was going to kill him, right? And then Ali's machine of just and it's also the pivot time of of media, right? More and more people are getting TVs in their home. Broadcasting is you know and, like and, it, and it's an interesting pivotal time. And there's also 
there's a, there's a there's one more very complex item that comes in that week. Ticket sales are slow. That's right. Ticket That's right. sales are slow because it's a blowout. Nobody's taking yeah. the fight seriously. And Chris Dundee and the co-promoter Bill McDonald, you know, they're like, you know, we got a problem. Yeah. And guess who's hanging around town that week? Who? Malcolm X. You're right. He was at the fight. He was at the fight. Sam Cook, a bunch of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the crew. What the hell's Malcolm X hanging around? Yeah. And then this whole rumor starts coming out that this lovable, big mouth, brash kid, Cassius Clay, is really a black Muslim. Right. And in those days, what in the world's a black Muslim? Sure. It, uh, and Chris Dundee famously says, my God, this is a disaster. Because Chris used to promote boxing on Tuesday nights and wrestling on Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. So he knew the promoter's dream was the good guy versus the bad guy. Right. He says, I got a good guy versus a bad guy. Now, all of a sudden, I got a bad guy against a bad guy. Who the hell wants to see a bad guy versus a bad guy? Yeah. And ticket sales are down. And they're all over, Cassius. Don't make any announcement yet. It'll kill right. the fight. It'll kill the fight. The weigh-in, which is an incredible story. Nobody had ever seen anything like that before, <laughs> ever. <laughs> ever. <laughs> the weigh-in, and you know, today you see all the shows around weigh-ins and so forth. In those days, it was a very stoic, very solemn. Yeah. Boring, almost, you know, yeah. the, the challenger, 198 pounds, the champion, 201 pounds, yeah. good luck, man, good luck, it was, that was about it. Yeah. Sonny Liston shows up for the way, in. now remember all the antics that Cassius Clay has been doing all along. Yeah, just teasing him, and yeah. And all of a sudden, Cassius Clay runs in. Where's that big ugly bear? I'm gonna come and knock him out right here. I ain't waiting. In those days, the weigh-in was the day of the fight. I ain't waiting till tonight. I'm gonna buy. I'm gonna beat him right now. And he he goes literally berserk. Yeah. And his joker was Bundini Brown. So he, you know, Bundini's holding him back. Let me add him, Bundini. I want him right now. I want him right now. Sonny is literally just sitting there looking. Nobody knows what to make of this. Sonny finally holds up two fingers like it's going to be a second round knockout. Everybody claps. And they announce that they're going to fine Cassius Clay, I don't remember, $2,000. Right. Yeah. Conduct on becoming of a professional boxer. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then things really get difficult because Alexander Robbins, the doctor of the medical, of the medical, chief medical doctor of the Miami Beach Boxing Commission, says, hey, this guy's pulse is out of sight right kid is scared to death to fight i can't let him in with this pulse now imagine you're in the middle of the way in. you're chris dundee and mick and bill mcdonald the co-promoters and the met the doctor is saying i ain't gonna let him fight like this <sighs> and then there's a deal and, and angelo is telling that guy look he's just joking it's don't take him seriously yeah. you know, the guy's a doctor right he doesn't he doesn't know about jokes right no uh, hey at this heart rate, he ain't going in. Yeah. And then Ferdy saves the fight. Ferdy, no way. Ferdy was a doctor and he knew Robbins very well. He says, Look, I'm not going to let, I'm his doctor. I'm not going to let him in like this. Let me do this. And there's a funny story behind this, too. He says, Let me do this. I'm going to take him back to his house. In those days, there were no cell phones or anything. Right, right, right. <laughs> you be at your office. I'll call you every hour on the hour and I'll tell you. What his pulse is. So this whole catastrophe, this whole show goes in. Yeah. And this is, this to me is one of the most amazing parts of the whole story. They get back into their limo and Cassius Clay is laughing his tail off. Mm -hmm. Laugh. Ferdy puts a blood pressure thing on him and it's already down by like 30. And Cassius Clay looks at him and he says, Doc, I just won this fight. 
And Angelo and Ferdy are looking at him like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. He says, a jailbird like Sonny Liston is afraid of nobody except a crazy man. All of these jailbirds are afraid of crazy guys. And now he knows I'm crazy. He <laughs> what I'm going to do. Guys, I already won the fight. And Pacheco calls the province and says, hey, listen, you want to come back and get his pressure? It's good. Yeah. <laughs> now, in the meantime, Chris is waiting for Chris and Bill McDonald. They're waiting for a big walk up the night of the fight. But the press is taking off with all kinds of crazy stories. Even the Cassius Clay, somebody saw him at the airport jumping on an airplane to go to Brazil because he's so scared okay. of the fight. And uh, and then, you know, then we, got, we, then we get to the fight. And the fight, walk me through. I mean, there's, there's so many highlights from the fight early on. Uh, the, obviously, the, the whatever happened to his eyes in the I think in the fourth round, and then the finish. What just highlights of the of the fight, and then how he shocks the world. He literally says it in the ring. Yeah, the um, I was stunned because I discovered something probably about ten years ago that I had never realized. If you watch all the YouTube videos of the fight, the thousands of pictures of the fight. You will never, ever see a video in the video of Cassius Clay coming into the ring. Doesn't really? Exist. Why? Because everybody wanted Sonny Liston. The video cameras are following Liston from his dressing room all the way into the ring. Cassius Clay walked into the ring first. They ignored Cassius Clay. The video shows Liston walking in. There was an old uh, Miami Herald photographer. Matter of fact, he's, he was a friend of your uh, brother, of your uncle Carlos. I don't remember his name, Tim, Tim Chapman. And he had a collection. He was a photographer for the Herald, and he had a collection of pictures that he took at the fight. And I've got a copy of the picture where Cassius Clay is um, flipping himself into the ring. He flipped over the top rope. Nobody's wow. ever seen that picture before. It was boxing historians don't know that because nobody ever captured Cassius Clay entering into the ring. They were that focused. Really? Um, yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, the fight itself, Danny, I think it's a beautiful fight if you look at it in the way that I'm going to describe it. In boxing, you have different ranges. You have you can box from a far from a far distance, and you can mm -hmm. do anything you want there at mid range that's dangerous because that now right. you got to tag each other yeah. and then short range it's bad things can happen but you're not going to get caught flush right. with in the first round the first two minutes of the round let's call it clay is just running and running at yeah. from distance and he's throwing out this jab after jab after jab beautiful jabs and <clears throat> i almost get the sense watching it that Liston is saying man i gotta take this kid seriously and Liston is lunging with his left and lunging with his left and can't catch him and like in the last <clears throat> excuse me 40 or 50 seconds of the first round clay starts opening up with one twos one twos one two threes one twos one twos beautiful combinations Liston goes back to his corner. In the second round, Clay starts getting cocky. And he goes from long range to mid range. And he's zapping him with combinations. Uh -huh. And you can see the difference in speed. Yeah. But every time that Liston throws a punch, I mean, he throws it with bad intentions. Yeah. And he actually clips Clay with one of those right hands. And Clay just grabs him and keeps dancing and keeps dancing and keeps dancing. The third round, there's some <clears throat> give and take in there, and Clay lands a perfect right hand, catches him on the cheek, and opens a cut under Sonny Liston's uh, left left cheek. Yeah, first time ever that Liston had been cut. Wow! What happened 
when Liston goes back to his corner. And this is one of the mysteries. The mysteries, the little dust or something happened. <laughs> in uh, there was a solution which is outlawed. Yeah. On cell solution, it's a very strong anticoagulant. But the old time trainers used to use it. Mm -hmm. And a guy named Joe Polino was his cutman. And he went way back and he put Monsell solution yeah. on, on, uh, on, on the, the cut. On the cut. Now, there are theories, and I believe in them, yeah. that he loaded Liston's gloves with either liniment or Monsell solution, mm -hmm. or he rubbed the liniment and or the on his shoulder. In the fourth round, they're fighting, and towards the end of the fourth round, <clears throat> Clay starts blinking. Angelo thinks he's been thumbed by a jab because in those days, the gloves, the thumb yeah. wasn't attached to the glove. Angelo thinks that he's been thumbed. He goes back to the corner at the end of the fourth round, and this was Angelo at his very best. Because there's a lot of dynamics that are going on in here. Clay is yelling, I can't see, cut him off. I can't see, cut him off. Cut him off. No. Be in the ring against the monster and, and you can't you see. You don't want to get killed, yeah. <clears throat> in the meantime, Angelo's looking down and there's three or four tough guys from the Muslims that are in the corner making sure everything goes good. Angelo takes a sponge the wet sponge, flicks it, let them see that he's there's nothing yeah. in the sponge, and he starts cleaning out his eyes. Yeah. He takes a from with his pinky, he takes a little bit of you know under the eye, puts it in his own eye, and it burns him. And he realizes that it's not a thumb, that he it's either Monsell solution. And Angelo being Angelo, he always said that accidentally got into his eye. I don't believe that and I'll tell you why. And he is screaming, cut him off, cut him off. Yeah. Towards the end of the round, Barney Felix, the referee, realizes there's something wrong. Angelo turns around and positions himself between the referee and Cassius Clay, mm -hmm. and he yells at him, this is the Big Apple, this is the championship of the world, and he pushes, kind of pushes Clay out and says, run, run, and Cassius Clay is running. But if you watch the films of that fifth round, Liston comes out roaring, and he throws everything. He probably, if you had had Compu stats or any of that stuff, yeah, yeah, he killed him. He probably threw a hundred punches in that round. He's lunges throwing for a big man like that. He's throwing yeah. at it and everything and everything, thinking this is my moment. Had they not used up the gloves or the shoulder or something, in my opinion, yeah. Liston would not have come out for that fifth round the way he did. It was a now or never. Now or never, right. Round. And towards the very end of that round, the sweat has cleaned out his eyes. And then Clay just starts teeing off on him. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Bell rings. The sixth round. He just, he hits him at will. Ba, 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 ba. Listen, you can see him at the end of that sixth round just bow his head and walk to the corner and he knows he shot his wad oh, yeah uh, he ain't yeah you know, nothing there's nothing he can do with this guy and in my opinion he just quits now that's just my opinion there's a thousand theories that go behind on. it right uh you know that he had bursitis on his left shoulder that he had yeah. well i've had bursitis you can't throw the punches that listen yeah, yeah. going in that fifth round and throughout the entire fight if you have bursitis, I think he just quit. Uh, you know, the bully gets slapped around and the bully quits. And so he the, knew he was going to have a rematch. So, you know, he just, and he wasn't going to be embarrassed in front of the whole world. No. And take the living, you know, the, the beating of his life. Because when he walks back with his head down, he knows there's no way he can beat this kid. No way. So the, the, the world changes forever after that. Number one, you have such an important figure, not just in sports and, you know, in, in, in history. Uh, but the next day he announces 
that he's converted, correct? It was actually two days later, because interesting, yeah. after the fight. Because the rumors had been going around that he The had, rumors had been yeah. going around. Now, after the fight, the Louisville group has a huge party planned at the Fountain Blue. Except one guy didn't show up. <laughs> yeah, he can't go. Famous story that's, uh, you know, they even made a, a movie a, of it. Uh, uh, Clay goes with uh, Jim Brown, Sam Cook, and Malcolm X, and they go to the Hampton House, which, mm -hmm. by the way, has been restored to the original yeah. condition, the original room, and so forth. And then they, they have a bowl of ice cream. Clay's celebration for winning the heavyweight championship Isn't that crazy? world is a bowl of ice cream in the fountain, and then they will go up to Malcolm X's room. And then what goes up went on in there, nobody knows, but they were at it till two or three o'clock in the morning. Jim Brown, uh, Malcolm X, Sam Cooke, and Muhammad Ali. It was my suspicion is where do we go from here? Uh, where do we go from here? To be a fly in the wall in that room oh. that night. I mean, right? It, that's why it became a, a play in a movie because you're fascinated what they were talking about in the times and um and you know it, it it just would have been really really special and uh and then two days later uh and he becomes cassius x he doesn't become muhammad ali yet oh that really was, yeah he announces that uh he's cassius x and he's a follower of the nation of islam and blah 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 and shortly thereafter elijah muhammad, muhammad and yeah. have a parting of ways right <clears throat> And Elijah Muhammad bestows the name of Muhammad Ali on then Cassius X Clay. Wow. And then, you know, obviously then history takes a turn. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. Well, Ramiro, thank you so much for coming on uh, the show. I had a blast going down memory lane. Uh, I will be sure on February 25th to watch the fight in its entirety. What's funny is I've, and I think like most people, I've seen pieces of it. I mean, I'm obviously a, a lot younger, but uh, I, I've never watched it from beginning to end, so I, I'm going to put it on my calendar to watch it. It's a beautiful fight to watch <clears throat> because you see the turn of events. Yeah. First round, Cash has done one. He, he really wants to. He's very cautious, dancing and dancing and dancing. And as the fight progresses, he realizes, hey, I can hit this guy anytime I want. He's too slow. And you see the transition to the sixth round, where in the sixth round, he just he's hitting him at will. <laughs> it's amazing it's amazing all right amigo thank you so much let's do this again enjoyed it